بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا ونبينا وحبيب قلوبنا أبي القاسم المصطفى محمد وعلى أهل بيته الطيبين الطاهرين المقصومين أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم ألم تر كيف ضرب الله مثلا كلمة طيبة كشجرة طيبة أصلها ثابت وفرعها في السماء تؤتي أكلها كل حين بإذن ربها ويضرب الله الأمثال للناس لعلهم يتذكرون صدق الله العلي العظيم On the third year of the Hijrah, after the immigration of the Prophet from Mecca to Medina, and on the middle of the month of Ramadan, on the 15th of Ramadan, a small room, very humble room, with very simple furniture, belongs to a newlywed. That small room and the entire city of Medina was radiant and shining with the light of a baby boy who had just been born. And that baby boy is Al-Hasan alayhi salam. He was born to his parents Imam Ali ibn Abi Talib and his mother Fatima al Zahra alayhi salam in a room next to the masjid. In fact, inside the mosque, that room. And that was the first grandson to the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And when the Prophet knew about the arrival of the baby, of course the baby was born in the same room, there was no hospitals at that time and maternity, you know, hospitals or departments. So he came and he took the baby and he wrapped the baby in, in a white cloth and then he recited the Adhan which is customary in Islam. When a baby is born, the father or someone in the family would recite the Adhan in the right side of his ears and the Iqama in the left side. And this is exactly what the Prophet did, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And then he turned to his father. He said, Ya Ali, what did you name your son? Imam Ali alayhi salam said, Ma kuntu li asbiqaka ya Rasulullah. I would never give him a name without asking your permission. Oh, the messenger of God. The messenger said, and I would not give him a name without getting the permission from God. Here, Gabriel, the archangel, descended upon the Prophet and he said, Ya Rasulullah, Al Ali Al A'la, the Lord, greets you and congratulates you, and he says, Name your first grandson as Al Hassan. So the name of Imam Al Hassan and both Imam Hussein came from the Lord by the order of the Lord, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And therefore, Imam Hassan was. He got his name from his grandfather, the Prophet وسلم, and he was raised also by the Prophet. And he was with the Prophet until probably the age of seven, when the Prophet died, or maybe eight. And then he was raised by his father and his mother in the house of Ali and Fatima. Then, he was with his father when his father moved from Medina to Kufa. At that time, Imam Hassan probably was in his mid-thirties. When, when his father died, he was about probably 37 or 38 years old. And the Muslims, the community of the Muslims, 
they chose him and they elected him and they paid allegiance to him as the next caliph after the murder of his dad. His father was died in the middle of the mosque when he was praying, as we're going to know about it in a couple of nights. So the son succeeded the father. But then there was a problem. There was a governor all the way in Syria in a land called Sham, which is the ancient name of Syria. And that governor did not pay allegiance to the new caliph, to Imam Hassan And he declared himself to be the caliph of the Muslim Ummah. And that governor by the name of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan probably was the most deceitful and deceiting and cunning leaders of all times. He wrapped himself in the cloth of piety, taqwa, and religion, but in fact, he himself accepted religion by force. He and his dad, his father, his father Abu Sufyan. And he was very manipulative. So he said, he asked Imam Hassan that you have to surrender to me and I have to be the caliph. Knowing that the people paid allegiance to Imam Hassan السلام, as the next caliph for the Muslim Ummah. He did not accept that. Muawiyah did not accept that. And he used two tools to fight the legitimate leadership. Two tools. One of them is propaganda. At that time, there were no Fox News and other news outlets. So they would hire, they would hire speakers. Speakers who are very good. They master the art of speaking. They are eloquent, convincing. They give them money. And they ask them to say. They ask them to fabricate. They ask them to tell stories. They ask them to falsely accuse this or that. So they fabricate a story and they deliver it to the masses. And the people would accept that. The same role that some media has today. They brainwash the population through these speakers. And this is what Muawiyah did. He hired certain people, their names are mentioned in the books of history. He would pay them money. Sometimes this money is, you know, high amount of money, big amount of money. And those people would say, would say to the masses what the caliph, what the leader wants them to say. So this is one venue. He would reach out to the people through those speakers that he hires. The second tool of fighting the legitimate leadership was through military actions. Muawiyah was in Syria at that time, in Damascus. And Muawiyah, unfortunately, was endorsed by the caliphs who were before him, namely two caliphs, Uthman ibn Affan and before him, Umar ibn al-Khattab. Muawiyah was appointed to be the governor of Syria during the time of the second caliph, Umar ibn al-Khattab. And when Uthman came to power, became the caliph, he would endorse him. So for almost 20 years, 20 years, two full decades, Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan was the governor of Syria for 20 years. So he threatened Imam Hassan, the newly elected government, which was at that time in Kufa, in Iraq, with military actions. And he did, he invaded Iraq with his army, with his army from Syria. They invaded Iraq and there were some casualties and some wars that I don't want you to, I don't want to go through these things tonight, that you can read them in the history. There were many casualties and lots of bloodshed. But Imam Hassan السلام, was keen to stop this bloodshed or even to prevent it from happening at the first place. He didn't want to see division in the Ummah and the community. 
Muslims fighting other Muslims. He didn't want to see this. So Imam Hassan decided that the best way is to uncover this person. This person is working in the name of Islam. The best thing is to uncover him and to expose him so people would know exactly the nature of this man, Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan. Many people were misled by him through his media, through his propaganda machine. They were misled by him. Imam Hassan decided that the best thing is to tell the people the truth, is to tell who this man is and what are his intentions. His intention was to destroy the entire religion, the entire Islamic faith. He would misinterpret the verses of the Quran. He would fabricate hadith sayings and attribute them to the Prophet ﷺ. False hadiths. They are not true. He would hire some people who are good at, you know, producing hadith. He would give them money, go to the pulpit, the mosque is packed with people and say, this is what the Prophet said. While we know that Muawiyah, he accepted Islam by force. Yes, it's a, it is a true. In the history of Islam, we have some people who accepted Islam willingly, out of love and conviction. And there are some people who accepted Islam by force. They didn't like Islam, but they had no choice. One of them is Muawiyah and his father Abu Sufyan. Read the details of how they converted to Islam. They were pagans, idol worshippers. On the eighth year, just a few months before the death of the Prophet, Prophet Muhammad وسلم, they had to accept Islam by force. They didn't believe Islam is the right religion. They wanted to remain pagans. And they looked at Prophet Muhammad as being their rival. They didn't even recognize him as being a prophet. They didn't recognize him. It was so hard for Muawiyah and his father to accept this term, this term, Ashhadu Anna Muhammad Rasulullah. It was so hard for them to accept it. They didn't accept it. But they had to. They had to. They had no choice. So such people who do not believe in Islam definitely would not come and serve Islam. And they had the opportunity of seizing the, you know, the government and these high positions and they would impose their will on the people. So this was the situation with Imam Hassan alayhis He he faced he was faced with a very difficult, tumultuous, very painful years. The last years of his life were very painful. Very painful. Until six months. Imam Hassan السلام, was caliph only for six months. By force, he was expelled and he was forced to sign the peace treaty with Muawiyah bin Abi Sufyan. And Muawiyah becomes the Caliph, Amir al Mu'mineen. What a beautiful name. The leader of the community of believers. Muawiyah, who had a hard time to believe in God, in the existence of God, now he is Amir al Mu'mineen. And this title and this situation of Muawiyah reminds me of one of the Muslim countries today that claims that they are the leaders of all the Muslims, but then you know what they do. You know some of what they do to Islam. I don't want to repeat that name of that country every night. You know it. Read the newspapers. So, here, Imam al-Hassan went back from Kufa to Medina, and he decided to nurture the people to teach the people. Ignorance is the biggest disease. People who surrender to Muawiyah, to someone who is very cunning and deceiving, and they accept him as a leader, that's, there, there is something wrong with that society. That society is not healthy. 
And that society wants to wake up and to learn. That society requires education and tarbiyah and refinement. So Imam Hassan decided to go and teach. Go and teach the people. One of the fabrications against Imam Hassan, which many people still say it today, even if you go to some Friday prayers at some mosques, you see the Imam saying this. This is a false hadith. I'm giving you an, an example. I'm giving you an example here of the false hadith that was created by Muawiyah himself. What does he say? He attributes to the Prophet that the Prophet said about Imam Hassan, in Ibni Hada Sayyidun, my son Hassan is Sayyid, master, leader. One day God is going to reconcile through him, reconcile between two great groups of the Muslims. Who are these two great groups? One of them, the group of Imam Hassan himself, and the other, the group of Muawiyah. Muawiyah was the one who fabricated this hadith to give legitimacy to himself, to say, I'm a legitimate group. See, the Prophet is saying about me, I'm a great group. The Imam never, the Prophet never said this hadith. Why did Muawiyah invent this hadith? Because Muawiyah in the battle of Safin against Imam Ali, the legitimate leader, he murdered 70,000. He was the reason 70,000 Muslims were killed. Many of them are companions of the Prophet ﷺ, Sahaba. They were companions. And one of them was a leader among the companions. And he was 97 years old when he was killed by Muawiyah. His name is Ammar ibn Yasr. Ammar ibn Yasr. The Prophet says about Ammar ibn Yasr, Muli'a imanan. Muli'a, he is full of faith from his head to his toe. Full of faith. This man at the age of 97 was murdered by the army of Muawiyah ibn Abi Sufyan during the battle of Safin. And he's buried in, in Syria. He's buried there. He was in the Syrian territory at that time. So Muawiyah wanted to vindicate himself. So he created this hadith. But that hadith is not true. That hadith is fabricated. In fact, when we read the history and investigate, see, reading alone does not help. You have to investigate. Your job, when you read the history, you have to investigate. You should be a researcher, not just you read. Because some, many of these materials that you read, it's not supported by evidence. Many of them were written by people who are hired just to write. You have to investigate. You have to research. Once you begin researching, you find the truth. So when we read about Muawiyah, we find that the Prophet, and this is according to great Sunni Huffaf. Huffaf, who is the Huffaf? Who is called Hafiz? No. Half of today, when someone memorizes the Qur'an, but this is not the actual meaning, real meaning. Hafil is the one who is transmitter of hadith, the hadith of the Prophet ﷺ. They call him Hafil. So many of those Huffad, transmitters of the hadith, who are Sunnis, such as Ibn Sa'd in his book, al tabaqat al-Kubra. This is a, a, a very important book in the Sunni tradition, such as such as Ibn Hajar in his book, Tahdeeb al tahdeeb Such as al dhahabi in his book, Mizan al-I'tidal. They say this hadith, they narrate this hadith of the Prophet. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he says, إِذَا رَأَيْتُمْ مُعَاوِيَةَ عَلَى مِنْبَرِي فَاقْتُلُوهُ If you see this man, Muawiyah, occupying my pulpit and speaking from my pulpit one day, murder him. Murder him, faqtulu. This is what the Prophet said about Muawiyah, Ibn Abi Sufyan. So he cannot be a leader of a great nation or a great group. 
You cannot. This is fabrication. Imam al Hassan decided that the best thing is to reach out to the people. People who are ignorant cannot succeed. Someone who is ignorant or a community that is ignorant cannot understand God, cannot accomplish anything in this life, cannot attain salvation, and therefore cannot reach paradise. Paradise is not reachable through ignorance. It is only reachable through reason, aql, using your aql. When you use your aql, this is where you have faith. Now, Thuraya, when she was telling us about these three verses, see, many of you read the verses, but you don't. We don't pay attention to these secrets. But when you reflect and you go deep down, here you're going to trust God more and love God. And here you're going to love the Quran. And here you're going to have real faith, not fake faith. Because you know God is the one who sent this book. This is not the work of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad does not know about these things. Muhammad did not know about these discoveries. She only gave three examples. There are 3,000 examples, scientific examples from this book. Not just medical. All areas. All areas. From the galaxies to the small atom. The Quran speaks about them. These are facts. So when we use our brain and our intellect, we really reach God, real God, and we're going to have real faith. But if through ignorance, we don't understand this book. Neither we understand God, and therefore the faith is going to be fake, not real. Imam Hassan said, I need to go back to the community and teach. Teach them through two things. For ilm, knowledge, and with knowledge, what comes with knowledge? Help me with that. Huh? Ilm and? Ilm and? Ahsan. But amal, how is the amal? Put it in another. Ilm and something else. Huh? Ilm and akhlaq, my friend. Akhlaq. Ilm alone, knowledge by itself, does not function if you don't put it beside akhlaq, manners. This is what Ahlul Bayt incorporated in their life. Al, knowledge, and akhlaq, both hand in hand. They work together. If you take akhlaq from al, al becomes only theories. And if you take al away from akhlaq, akhlaq becomes only what? Rituals. Rituals. People pray, rituals means they pray, record sujood, but it does not have content, does not have a spirit. These are rituals. But when you put, when you put ilm next to it, akhlaq, it becomes faith, true faith. Therefore, he started helping, reaching out to people through education and akhlaq. And he is well known for his generosity. He was so generous. Imam Hassan is being defined within the family of the Prophet as being Kareem Ahlul Bayt, the most generous in the family of the Prophet. He's the most generous. No person comes to him asking him anything and that person would go empty-handed. Sometimes they say to him, Oh, Ya Ibn Rasulullah, Imam Hassan, maybe this person, he has money, he doesn't need. He's just, you know, he wants to get more money. He says, yes, I know. Sometimes he's not hungry. Maybe he has money. But since he knocks at my door, I would not return him empty-handed. I would not do that. And he said one time, this hadith, he said, Inni lillahi sa'il, when they said to him, we haven't seen you one day repelling, repelling an inquirer when they come to you asking. Sa'il means, Sa'il means a beggar. We never, we never saw you shutting your door in their face. He said, Inni lillahi Sa'il, because I'm a beggar myself, but to God. 
I am begging him his mercy, his forgiveness. We are beggars. We are sad. فأما اليتيم فلا تقهر وأما السائلة ها وأما السائلة فلا تنهر وأما بنعمة ربك فحد. We are sad. We beg God for His mercy, for His forgiveness, for His bounties. So he said, I myself, I'm asking God. وأنا أستحي أن أكون سائلا وأرد سائلا. I am too embarrassed that I am myself a beggar to God, and when someone comes and begs, I repel him. I don't do that. I don't do that. One day, a story. He was walking in Medina. There were some young kids. You know, they recognized him. He's the grandson of the Prophet. Out of respect for the Prophet, they said to him, "Ya Hassan, Imam Hassan, come and." have food with us. He said, of course, I will. So he left. He went to their, you know, corner. They were eating. So he joined them. He, he ate. And then the following day, he invited them to his house. When he invited them to his house, he said, they are more generous than me. They said, how come? He said, because they gave me all their food, everything they owned. They put it in front of me. While I did not give them everything I owned, part of what I own. This is a lesson for us. Real generous is not the one who gives you part. Sometimes he takes everything and he gives it to you. This is real generosity. Not the surplus. Not the surplus. Though I said today in the Friday prayers, don't take your entire food and give it to someone else. No. Neither take your entire clothing and give it to someone else. No. Islam is not asking you to deprive yourself in order for you to give out. Share. Islam says share. Take for yourself and give to others. Sharing. So when someone has little and he would, he's ready to give that little, that is real generosity. Not when it is surplus and I don't know what to do with it. Like some people, they, they have extra furniture, they bring it to the masjid, you know. Extra pair of shoes, they bring it to the mosque. Extra clothing, before they dump it in the trash, they bring it to the masjid. This is not generosity. Neither this is donation. Real donation and real giving when you give what you love, not what you want about to throw in the trash. This is not... Many Muslims, unfortunately, they treat their masajid as dumpster. This is how they treat it. They don't have respect. As Samir said, we have shoe rugs, but go outside and see the shoes. Where, where are they? Go outside. Go in the lobby and see. Where is the adab? Where is the manners in Islam? Shouldn't we clean after we eat? We clean after ourselves. Shouldn't we contribute? Shouldn't we help? Shouldn't we keep the masjid neat, clean? These are the manners of Islam. What are we going to learn? When? Some people are not learning. It's about teaching. It's about education. Islam should be quality religion, not just religion. Quality religion. Islam is not by numbers, by quality. It's not by quantity, how many people we have. I don't care how many, even if they are five billion. If we have one million who are organized and committed and dedicated, they are much better than five billion. And this is the wording of this book, not me. God says, if there is, if there is 20 people who are organized among you and committed to their faith and to their Lord, they are better than 200 person, people who are disorganized. And if you have 100 people organized and committed, they are better than 1,000 who are disorganized. We Muslims, we love numbers, big numbers. We don't love organization. We don't. We love numbers. We get excited when we have big numbers. Islam says equality. Quality is important. Let me conclude with what Imam Hassan said to someone who cursed him. Someone came from Syria full of hate. This is what we face today. In some societies tomorrow, there are in many cities 
throughout the nation in America, there is a march against Islam tomorrow, Saturday, organized by some Islamophobic in this country. So someone came and he was yelling at the Imam in Medina. He was yelling at him, cursing him, right in his face. Imagine, Imam is the grandson of the founder of Medina. Imagine someone comes to the son of George Washington and he curses him in, in the middle of Washington, D.C. This is what used to happen for Ahlul Bayt. They are the children of the Prophet. They cursed them. They murdered them. Imam Hussein was murdered by Muslim community, by people who pray, people who fast, people who say, Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah, Ashhadu anna Muhammad Rasulullah. These things happened in Islam and are happening now. These things are still happening. So this person comes to curse him. Listen to the answer of the Imam. He was not angry. Imam was not frustrated. Imam was cool. And he said to him, Ahsabuka gariban ayyuha shaykh. Oh my old man. Shaykh means, Shaykh is a good title. When you respect someone in the Arab culture, you call him Shaykh. Ahsabuka gariban. I think you are a stranger. You are from outside of town. You are not one of the people of the city. فَإِن كُنْتَ جَائِعًا أَشْفَعْنَاك If you are hungry, we would feed you. وَأَوْ عُرْيَانًا كَسَوْنَاك If you need clothing, we will cover you. أَوْ مُحْتَاجًا أَغْنَيْنَاك If you are in need, we will enrich you. أَوْ طَرِيدًا آوَيْنَاك If you are a fugitive, we will give you shelter. When this man heard this from the Imam, he's cursing him, and the Imam is returning the curse with love, with shelter, with compassion, with a humanity. He said to him, Ashhadu annaka khalifatullahi fi ardih, Allahu a'lamu haythu yaj'alu risalat. I bear witness that you are the caliph and representative of God on earth. And God knows who to choose for that leadership. And then he said the following. He said, كُنْتَ أَنْتَ وَأَبُوكَ أَبْغَضُ خَلْقِ اللَّهِ إِلَيْهِ وَالْآنَ أَنْتَ وَأَبُوكَ أَحَبُّ خَلْقِ اللَّهِ إِلَيْهِ Minutes before, you and your father Ali were the most hated in my eyes. Now, you switch this 180 degrees. Now, you and your father Ali ibn Abi Talib are the most beloved people to my heart. This is akhlaq. This is akhlaq, my friends. Akhlaq is magical, creates magic, turns people 180 degrees. I remember a few months ago, maybe last year, some of the bikers in Arizona, they decided to surround a mosque during Friday prayers and attack that mosque. Bikers who are, you know, wearing tattoos and some, some of them carrying weapons. And here, many people, they freaked out. They decided not to go to the mosque to be stay in Dome. But some leaders in that mosque, they said, when they come and they surround our mosque, we will provide them with food and a drink. Food and a drink. And this is exactly what they did. And those bikers, they came with the intention of attacking Maligning, cursing, but when they saw food and a drink coming, and some of them definitely they love kebab, who doesn't, you know? <laughs> Smells good. That's it. It was diffused completely. The anger went away. They were busy eating and drinking, and they started smiling. And this is a theory in this book. When someone is attacking you, don't attack him back. Use a good method. Use your intelligence, use your love, use your heart. Because some people are confused and some people are ignorant. They think that you are here to destroy. They don't know about you. So when you show them love and comp compassion, you diffuse that anger. This is what we learn from Rasulullah from Imam Hassan 
and from the family of the Prophet. Allahumma khfir lil mu'mineen wal mu'minat, wal muslimin wal muslimat, al ahya'i minhum wal amwat, tabi'in lahum wa baynana wa baynahum bil khayrat, wa ajjil fi faraj sayyidina, wa maulana sahib al asri wal zaman, aqulu qawli hadha, wa astaghfiru allaha li wa lakum, wa sallallahu wa sallam ala sayyidina Muhammad, wa ahli baytah al-tayyibin al-tahirin.